Good evening, everyone. Let's get started. Um, they've taken our podium away, so we're going to sit and deliver our, our little remarks. I'm uh, Kerry Dunn. I'm the president of New York City Bar Association. I want to welcome you all uh, to this evening. Uh, we're honored, as you know, to have with us tonight uh, Chen Gua Cheng, uh, Professor Jerry Cohen, Fritz Schwartz, and Ira Belkin, who are here to discuss uh, the dangers of rights lawyering in China these days and the role of American law firms there. Uh, Mr. Chen, of course, uh, who we're very pleased to have with us, uh, knows all too well the dangers of rights lawyering in China, uh, and I'm sure his insights and experiences will be very thought-provoking this evening. Um, before we begin that discussion, however, we have the privilege of uh, granting Mr. Chen honorary membership in the association, which, as you'll hear in a minute from Judge Sidney Stein, is a rare and important event for this organization. Um, before that, though, I want to take a minute just to point out, um, from my point of view, how tonight's discussion really is representative of the City Bar's historical and ongoing involvement in international affairs. Um, long before the term globalization was a term of art and popular, um, it, this association had a global perspective. Uh, it was in this building 65 years ago that the International Bar Association was formed. It's in this room uh, that the World Conference of City Bar Leaders was formed uh, some years ago, just after the September 11 attacks, and it's still very active. Um, Fifteen of our City Bar committees here address uh, legal, policy, and human rights issues uh, worldwide. Uh, just two nights ago, uh, we held a program here called Doing Business in Developing Countries, the Importance of the Rule of Law which itself was an outgrowth of uh, a, a meeting at the recent UN General Assembly, which uh, I, I attended, on the rule of law, and on and on. Um, this is, you, you get the point. On the subject of international human rights, uh, we are continually issuing, issuing reports, writing to heads of state, submitting amicus briefs, and working with foreign bar leaders to investigate the treatment, particularly of judges and lawyers um, in different jurisdictions, um, as what we like to think of ourselves as the major bar association of this worldwide city. Um, we recognize that our responsibilities um, extend far beyond our five boroughs, um, and that we can't ignore problems that, while maybe based abroad and elsewhere, will have repercussions for us and everyone else around the, around the world. So, uh, as an example of this, I would just mention that the most recent committee we at the City Bar have formed is called the Task Force on Adaptation to Climate Change, uh, which will be addressing the, um, the serious international legal issues that will arise from global warming, including the loss of uh, potentially huge land areas and, in some cases, entire nations to um, rising ocean waters around the world. So that's, that's the plug for the City Bar on our international involvement. Um, just to conclude, I want to thank uh, both the Council on International Affairs of the City Bar, which is chaired by former City Bar President Betsy Plevin, who's here tonight, uh, and the Committee on uh, International Human Rights, uh, chaired by Elizabeth R Wickery, uh, for putting together this program tonight, which is very special. Um, I now want to introduce uh, to my right uh, the Honorable Sidney Stein of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, who also happens to be the chair of our association's Honors Committee. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, the essence of my remarks have, and the words on the plaque itself have already been translated for Mr. Chen. Uh, Article 3 of the association's constitution provides that members of the legal profession who are of preeminent distinction, either in this country or any foreign country, are eligible to be elected honorary members of the Association of the Bar of the City of New York. In the past 95 years that this honor has been in existence, honorary membership has been conferred on only 62 jurists, lawyers, and public officials, including presidents of the United States and Chief Justices of the United States, among others. Mr. Chen is surely qualified to enter this pantheon. Denied a university education due to his disability, he undertook a rigorous course of self-study of the law. He has courageously advocated in China for the rights of the disabled, the impoverished, the underserved, and the vulnerable. His advocacy has included included fighting for the right to free public transportation for the disabled, both in 
Shandong province and in Beijing. He also challenged and won tax exemptions for farmers with physical disabilities. He advocated to close a paper mill that was destroying the livelihood of farmers, and he established a rights defense project for the disabled, as well as pursuing an extraordinary action to stop forced abortions and sterilizations ordered by officials in the city of Linyi, Shandong province. These are just a few of his many undertakings in support of the disadvantaged. Mr. Chun's work has exacted a substantial personal toll on both himself and his family. As you know, he was placed under house arrest in September of 2005 and was subsequently convicted and sentenced on a criminal charge that was widely viewed as fa fabricated, even though an intermediate court determined that there was insufficient evidence to support the conviction. It was remanded to the court below, and Mr. Chen was uh, convicted again and sentenced to a full four years in prison. After fully serving his term, Mr. Chen and his wife, who's here tonight, as well as his daughter, remained effectively under extra-legal house arrest and were isolated in his home village. Earlier this year, as much of the world now knows, Mr. Chen escaped that detention by fleeing through fields at night and ultimately was taken to the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. After hurried negotiations between the American and Chinese governments, he and his family were granted visas for him to study law at New York University under the aegis of Professor Cohen. Members of his extended family in China, however, continue to suffer harassment, surveillance, and criminal charges as a result of his advocacy and his flight. Mr. Chun has long personified the bedrock principles that inspired the creation of the city bar and that Carrie Dunn was referring to. Promoting reforms in the law, facilitating and improving the administration of justice. He is a leading example of the struggles and, and state-condoned relentless retaliation facing advocates in China who rise to represent the utterly powerless and advance unpopular claims on their behalves. Mr. Chun tonight honors the city bar by allowing us to recognize his distinguished history of legal advocacy and personal courage. I'd like to read the inscription on the plaque which has been translated into Braille as well. <clears throat> Having found Chen Guangsheng by unanimous vote of the executive committee to be of preeminent distinction in the world legal community, in recognition of his dedication to ensuring that the Chinese legal system affords its citizens the rights granted them by their country's laws for his tireless advocacy on behalf of China's disabled, disadvantaged, exploited, and mistreated, and for his extraordinary personal courage in employing the law to advance the public interest despite the substantial challenges he has faced and the personal toll such actions have taken on himself and his family we hereby confer upon Chen Guangshen honorary membership in this association on the 7th day of February 2013, and it's signed by Carrie Dunn, President, myself, and Deborah Raskin, Chair of the Executive Committee. Mr. Chen, congratulations, Hi. sir. Uh 
呃这个荣誉会员的这个荣誉。I'm very honored to accept this、uh, honor from the New York City Bar Association, and I thank you very much for giving me this honorary admission、uh, to your association. Uh, 长期以来，我们知道纽约市律师协会一直以来为这个维护法治、推进司法改革、捍卫人权做出了许多重要的工作。啊，这样的事情其实很多中国的民众也都知道。Um, the New York City Bar Association is well known、uh, as an organization that has、uh, protected the rights of people and has promoted the rule of law and legal reform.、Uh, even many people in China know this. Uh, just now I heard that the New York City Bar Association has such a provision, which is that it doesn't discriminate against anyone, whether it's American or international. Ah, just as long as 确实做了事情就会受到他们的肯定，这一点让我想起了公平正义没有国界，而这样一个这这样一种理念在纽约市律师协会直接的体现了出来。Um, just now I heard that according to the uh, uh, New York City Bar Association、um, rules that this membership, this honorable membership, can be given to Uh, people who are Americans or people of from foreign countries, and to me, this、uh, represents that when it comes to fairness and justice, there are no national borders, and the Charter of the New York City Bar Association reflects this、uh, value and principle. Ah, 在世界很多地方，啊，有有很多，特别是一些弱势群体人群，他的最基本的权利。最基本的人权都得不到保障，甚至在被践踏。所以我也怎么说呢？跟呃，我也希希望将来能有机会和纽约市律师协会一起，我们来推动在这些地方尊重人权、实行法治，让社会更加公正起来。Uh, right now in the world, there are many places where those who are、uh, disadvantaged Uh, uh, the basic rights of those people who are disadvantaged cannot be protected uh, and uh, are even deprived. I hope that we can work together with the New York City Bar Association、uh, to help protect the human rights、uh, of those people and to promote the rule of law together. Many Chinese lawyers are now working to promote the rule of law and the society. 断的努力啊，将来我们可以就中国目前的法治状况，接下来我会跟大家一起交流。谢谢大家，非常感谢美这个纽约市律师协会授予我这份荣誉，非常感谢。Uh, right now, there are many、uh, lawyers in China who are fighting for social justice、uh, and the rule of law, and、uh, we'll we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But right now, I just want to、uh, express my extraordinary gratitude for the honor that you've bestowed on me. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth. Oh, well, thank you, everyone. I just、um, wanted to take one minute to thank you all for for coming out tonight and introduce the、uh, discussion portion of our program,、um, just by way of introducing a little bit、um, the work on China that the New York City Bar Association has been doing over the past few years, both through the International Human Rights Committee and also the Council on International Affairs. This has involved、um, writing letters、um, when it comes to lawyers like Mr. Chen, who have faced in. Intimidation and harassment as a result of their work, as well as in 2009,、um, a mission to China that resulted in a report, which you can download、um, on our website.、Um, right before、uh, turning things over, I wanted to point out that、um, there are at the door printed out for you、um, principles that this association adopted last year. 
uh, or two years ago, um, the lawyer's statement of principles regarding China, which I think um, provides a good jumping off point for the discussion that we're going to have tonight on what is our role, what is the role of lawyers in New York City, um, and particularly the role of um, American law firms that have a presence in China. So I urge you to have a look at those, and they are also available on our website. Um, and so finally, um, in this discussion, I'm, I'm happy to say that we have a lawyer with his feet firmly in both private practice and, um, and public practice to help moderate this discussion. Um, Fritz Schwartz's practice um, in, in private law was at Cravath, um, where he was the litigation partner with a broad and varied practice. And in 2002, he joined the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU um, full time and is the chief counsel there. So um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Fritz, for taking this over. And um, I hope you enjoy the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And thank you, Corey. And thank you, Judge Stein. We're going to have a discussion rather than presentations. And after this discussion among the people up here, we hope people in the audience can enter into it, not with speeches, but with short questions or comments. I'd just like to make two observations about the award you were just given, Mr. Chen. Um, first, in 60 people in 90 years, have been given honorary membership in this association. As I look down the list, you are almost unique in being a practicing lawyer as opposed to a judge or other public official. And I believe you are totally unique in being a lawyer who is neither from the United States nor the United Kingdom nor from nations which were once colonies of the United Kingdom. I'm quite certain you are unique in that sense. So that is an enormous honor that you've been given and is worthy of another round of applause. So the second observation is the curiosity that all four of us up here are now wherever we may have been before, connected with NYU Law School. I mean, for me, particularly bred in Harvard, now coming to love NYU, it is quite a thing. But it's amazing, four people, all from one law school in this city. Now, just a word about the two other panelists. You know them all, but let me just briefly highlight a few things. Ira Belkin is now the US Asia Law Institute's executive director. He was for a long time a program officer at the Ford Foundation in Beijing working on law and rights issues. He spent seven years in China to promote the rule of law in China. And he's been a fellow at the Yale Law School Clinic Law Center and he has a lot of other things including graduating from NYU Law and all kinds of degrees which we don't need all of. <laughs> and Jerry Cohen is now a professor of law at NYU Law School. He was a professor at Harvard Law School, and I remember when I was on the overseers, Jerry, President Derek Bach spent some 10 minutes at one meeting of the overseers extolling you as a very fine person and leader of the law school. Uh, Jerry's also been a partner at Paul Weiss, and he served in many, many ways on Chinese issues uh, of enormous importance and was very much responsible in bringing the, helping the honoree to get to this country when he was being imprisoned and escaped to the U.S. Embassy and then came here. So as I said, we're going to have a discussion first and I'd like to open it by asking each of the three how they got involved in questions of Chinese law for the two Americans, and how you, Mr. Chen, decided to get involved in issues of human rights and fair treatment of people in China. Uh, I want to ask the first question to the three people. 
呃呃，我们两个就是柯教授和我，嗯，呃，我们是如何呃进入这个中国法？为什么对中国法开始感兴趣？然后对呃陈先生，呃，想问，呃，你是怎么对这些法律问题、人权问题开始感兴趣的？好，来，你们先。Who would you like to go first? Go, Chen. 啊 ，OK， 你先讲。呃，当时呢。在中国，很多很多的残疾人，现在可能差不多要有，呃，一个亿的数字吧，好像是最初的统计有六千万残疾人，现在的数字更正，差不多有一个亿。那么这些残疾人的权益长期得不到合法的保障，在那，特别是在九一年中国颁布《残疾人保障法》以后，残疾人的权利依然没有保障。Um, there are many, many disabled uh, persons in China. Um, maybe the most recent statistics uh, are that there are a uh, hundred million um, uh, disabled per people, and their rights, uh, they have difficulty um, protecting their rights. Many of these disabled people have been long and long ago. 而且非常突出的一点就是践踏残疾人权益的，恰恰就是来自。党党政。Um, many many times their their rights are infringed upon, and it's or uh, they're deprived of their rights, and often it's government officials who are depriving them of their rights. 所以这个时候，既然有了法律，我想我们应该通过法律来捍卫这种基本的权利，特别是在我们多次与地方党政官员交涉无效啊以后，我想到了。法律是有它的强制力，我们可以通过法院来维护这种基本权利。Um, and although there are many laws protecting the rights of persons with disabilities, um, often it's difficult for those rights to actually be enforced in practice. And uh, at the time, I realized that many local officials were not enforcing or protecting the rights of、uh, people with disabilities, and I learned that the law could be a powerful tool to compel people to protect. And enforce and recognize the rights of people with disabilities. Ah, 这个时候呢，我就开始学习法律，来使用法律。再一个，像残疾人要找到正规的律师，在当时是非常难的。一个是残疾人本身很穷，没有没有办法来交律师费用。第二个呢，打这样的官司，呃，律师都会考虑到，因为牵扯到很多行政诉讼啊，就是民告官的诉讼，他们都不愿意做。So at that time, I decided、um, I wanted to learn the law because I wanted to use the law.、Uh, also, at that time,、uh, it, it was clear that regular lawyers、um, were not interested in taking these cases.、Uh, people with disabilities were too poor to pay lawyers' fees, and because these cases involved、uh, ordinary people suing government officials,、uh, a lot of lawyers weren't willing to take on those cases. 呃，这样一开始做呢，开始是残疾人，后来就是农民呀。啊，这个还有农民工啊，还有其他的一些环保问题啊，还有一些妇女等各方面的问题，变，呃，怎么说呢，就呃全部都来了，所以说就很自然的就走上了这样一条路。So at first,、uh, I was just representing、uh, people with disabilities, but later on, I started to represent farmers and migrants, migrant workers, and then I also brought some environmental cases and then some cases on behalf of women, and then. Cases just started to to come to me, and that's how I ended up、uh, on this path. 不公正发生在身边的时候，很自然的就去做了。When、uh, unjust things happened、uh, in my in my path of vision, it was just very natural for me to to try to do something. Very good, Ira. Why don't you give your own history? Okay. Um, so the question was, how did I first get interested in, in Chinese law? Yeah.、Um, I'll try and give a brief answer.、Um, I studied Chinese in college and graduate school, and、uh, couldn't find a job. So, <laughs> so I went went to law school, and then really didn't have anything to do with Chinese law for many many years.、Uh, and then the, in the beginning of in January of 2000, I went to China, mainland China, for the first time. The Department of Justice. I was a federal prosecutor at the time, and I was there to talk to counterparts, Chinese prosecutors, about American law, 
and also to learn about Chinese law. And what I discovered was that uh, people in China were incredibly interested, had almost an insatiable appetite to learn about um, American law and how uh, our legal system operates. And I thought if people were interested, uh, then this was something that uh, I could do to <coughs> help satisfy some of that interest and, and appetite. So Jerry, for you, but in your answer, will you, after the gener general discussion of how you got involved in Chinese affairs, Chinese law, how did you get connected with our honoree, and was that difficult to communicate with him when you were seeking to help him? I owe it all to Dean Rusk, not during his tenure as Secretary of State, because he didn't do much to move our relations toward China, but before that, he was president of Rockefeller Foundation and a very far-sighted person until he got before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for their approval as Secretary of State. And Rusk thought there should be someone in the United States who knew about the Chinese legal system because even in 1960, he could see that we would be moving toward a better relationship with China and he wanted us to be prepared. I thought it was a zany idea, but after trying to persuade a lot of other people on my faculty and elsewhere, I was at Berkeley then, I talked myself into it. No one else was interested. And I discovered Confucius had said, establish yourself at 30. Sun sure early. And I was just 30. And I thought, go for it. Uh, if you're going to leave lucrative law practice, do a, a pioneer's job. Do something no one else has done before. Of course, most people thought mm -hmm. I was having a nervous breakdown. Uh, why throw away a promising career in a country you can't even go to? Well, I remember being in this room in January 66, the first time probably anybody ever discussed Chinese law in this room. The late Arthur Kramer, who founded Kramer Levin Law Firm, saw early on this was an important subject. It was a cold, bitter night, and there were probably a dozen people in the audience. So you see, tonight we've made a lot of progress. Well, how did I meet Mr. Chun? Uh, again, luck is very important in life, and you have to recognize it. Usually, when Chinese lawyers come here under the auspices of the Department of State, uh, they call me up and ask me to meet them, and I try to, and I always benefit from it. But in June 2003, I got a call to meet this fellow, Chun, and I said, look, I haven't finished grading my exams. I have to go to China in four days. I have no time, and this fellow hasn't even studied law. Why are you bothering me? And they said, he is special. You should meet him. So finally, I said, half an hour. Well, after half an hour with Mr. and Mrs. Chun, I wanted more time, and we spent several hours. And then we arranged to meet when I got out to Beijing to start teaching at Tsinghua University Law School. And after he came up to Beijing, he said, you know, you'll never understand what I do unless you come down to our village. And he invited my wife and me down there for three days. And you've never seen humbler circumstances. A poorer village I've never seen in China, just 500 people. I spent the first day walking around with him. I wanted to see what did the villagers think of this guy? Did they think as many Chinese would think he's a troublemaker? But no, they loved him because he had already done things to help the village. And the next day, it was a terrible rainy day. We stayed inside all day at his house, meeting a succession of his so-called clients. You never saw a poor bunch of people, deformed people, people with every kind of disability, people who had tax problems, people who had all kinds of difficulties, and he gave them free advice. As he said, they had no alternative. I was profoundly moved. Then the third day, we started to talk about cooperation about training. He wanted to train 200 barefoot lawyers like him just in his county. Explain barefoot lawyers. Oh, barefoot lawyer is a term often used, uh, it's taken off from the old barefoot doctors. 
You remember before the Cultural Revolution and even during, China had uh, barefoot doctors, people who hadn't really had medical training, but given sort of uh, aid, how to be a medical aid worker. Well, he developed this idea with others that even though had no formal legal training, they could, through self-study and practice, come to the aid of people who needed help and when professional lawyers weren't available or didn't want to help. And that was the origin of it. I thought his dream of training 200 people in his county was not going to happen because the authorities would crack down. But he is an optimist, as you'll see tonight, you've already heard. And they did crack down before we could implement it. But later, the Ford Foundation did help uh, train a large group of barefoot lawyers in another province. So his ideas have taken root. He was famous when he came here. He was successful initially in China until he became too successful. And then the local authorities found him so annoying, they just locked him up first at home in severe circumstances. And then on trumped up charges, they sent him away for four years and three months. And they met him at the jail the day he was free and locked him up in even tighter quarters at home. Well, we're happy he's now here. When I first came here in 1966, in this room, I never dreamt these kinds of events could occur. Well, th thank you. The, you know, the, um, you said luck is important. Yeah, that's true, but luck is the residue of desire. And I think you impl uh, exemplify that. I believe that's a quotation from a Yankee baseball player, not Yogi Berra, but <laughs> one of, I think Joe DiMaggio, actually. So we're, we're going to come soon to what can lawyers and law firms do about the difficulties of protecting human rights and helping what can they do to help Chinese lawyers. But before doing that, I'd like to have the three of you talk about what are the roots of law in China. If you ask that question about the United States, you'd say the roots of law, you know, and you might start with Peter Zenger here in New York City, challenging an effort by the King's agents to suppress a newspaper. Or you could take it right up today and talk about lawyers in, from New York City law firms who were defending Guantanamo detainees and who a rogue officer in the Department of Defense tried to get their clients to stop using those firms. And the New York lawyers resisted that, and the rogue officer, high-level officer in the Department of Defense under Bush Cheney was ousted. So we, we have a great tradition in our short history, and it's not just real life, it's in fiction, like um, Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird, where a lawyer courageously defends, defends a black man charged with murder in, in Mississippi. And um, de Tocqueville had a wonderful quote about lawyers in America, because he was writing in the 1830s. You've got to ask whether today the same um, expression would be made. But de Tocqueville said, Lawyers are the sole enlightened class in America that people do not generally discuss, adding that the American aristocracy is at the attorney's bar and the judge's bench. So in our short history, there's a lot about the important role lawyers play. But what I'd like to ask the three of you is what are the traditions in China? What is the history? What is the literature? What are the books? You've got in China, you know, thousands of years of history. And in that history, what kind of role have lawyers played? Have they been regarded as important or not important? So whoever wants to start, start. Uh, 我觉得在中国的传统当中
看起来非常合理，那么怎么跟当时的法规，呃，就是说合理还要合法，把这个在公堂上把它阐述清楚，啊，使得呢和当时的国家的那些法律，呃，能够吻合起来，能够让它的合理的利益得到保障。啊，我觉得这是中国法律的最初的一种状态。尽管那个时候有凌驾于法律之上的皇权，但是法律在很多时候还是起作用。Uh, I think in traditional Chinese society, the role of the lawyer was to speak for people who couldn't really speak for themselves. And so, in the magistrate's court and public places,、uh, they would try to articulate clearly what was the reason behind、uh, the law. And what was the meaning of the law? So even though in those times、uh, China was under an imperial system, there still were laws. 2,500 years ago, China was having sophisticated discussions about the role of law. That's where Confucius and the Confucians and the Legalists and the Taoists and others began to debate these questions. And there was a distinguished legal system 2,000 years ago, certainly by the time of the Tang Dynasty, and of course by the time of the Revolution of 1911, you had a highly articulated. Legal system. You had very complex laws that were published.、Uh, you had、uh, legal institutions. Of、uh, the magistrate was a jack of all trades at the lower level, but you had, as you went higher in the administrative bureaucratic scale, increasing degree of specialization among the、uh, people who had to apply the law, especially in the capital. The emperor, in the end, did what he wanted, but he was under philosophical and some practical restraints if he wanted to be respected. But there were no lawyers in this operation,、uh, as、uh, Mr. Chun indicated. There were people who had some of the functions of lawyers, but they were never legitimate. They were never really recognized. They weren't allowed into the magistrate's yamen, his bureau. Uh, they were innkeepers, or they were people in the marketplace who helped、uh, illiterate people to write out a complaint. They were often considered disreputable, people who drummed up disputes so they could earn some money. Lawyers didn't exist and had a very bad reputation until the revolution of 1911. They were just coming into play as China was beginning to modernize. And in 1912, you had the first regulation to establish a legal profession, but they still had a rather poor reputation, and they were limited to big cities, especially Shanghai. So this is a very different background from the one that you heard Fritz describe a little earlier. So Ira,、um, I want you to pretend you're now back at the Ford Foundation, and two. Um, supplicants for a big grant come to you. These two gentlemen, what 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 tough questions would you ask them? Well, if they're from NYU, I probably wouldn't ask too many tough questions. <laughs>、um, no, but seriously,、um, the kinds of things we、uh, would think about is、um, how can how can、uh, different kinds of programs, different kinds of activities, make a positive difference. Uh, in the rule of law in China,、uh, there are many people in China who are working to improve the legal system. Some of them、uh, are famous, like Mr. Chun, but many of them are not well known. Some of them are in on law school faculties. Some of them are even in the government. And there has been a great deal of progress made in legal reform in China over the last 30 years. So we look for practical programs that have some. Uh, effect that might help solve a particular problem、uh, in the law. And、uh, what's the hardest question you would ask them, though? Well, I guess there are two two kinds of hard questions. 
when someone comes to me with a proposal that sounded too good to be true, I would say, can you really get, whether it's the Chinese police or other government officials, to really do this? Um, and uh, another kind of question is, is this, is this really going to make a difference? Um, uh, so practical questions like that. Great. So now to the three of you, um, a double question. What can be done to help um, Chinese lawyers and develop the law in China? And sub-question to that, can a foreign nation like the United States do much without appearing to exceed its proper role in um, trying to influence crucial uh, forces and events in a nation like China? So first I want to say that uh, law, the reason law exists is to bring order to society. A law is a tool, it's like a, a ruler, and it sets the standards for people's behavior. And in this sense, law doesn't really have boundaries. Uh, uh, uh,我想只要是违反了这样一个公正的基本原则的时候,呃,每一个人也都有责任有义务来改变这种现状。呃,我想现在最重要的,咱们的律师协会这些章程能够公开出来关心,我觉得这是一个非常好的方法。我另外
um, everyone should speak out. And if everyone speaks out with the same voice, we can make a difference. He's really referring now to the case of his nephew, Chun Kuk Wei. Uh, after Chun Guang Chung succeeded in avoiding escaping uh, the police and their thugs and came to America even before he got here, the local police, uh, in revenge and fury at their embarrassment, stormed into the nephew's house after midnight over 30 of them. And they started to beat his father, and they took his father away, and then they were beating the nephew, and they were beating the mother, and they were gonna kill him if you believe their shouts. And the nephew went into the kitchen, got a knife, and used it to defend himself, and nicked three of them, including, unfortunately, the leader of the local government. And he was taken in, and the family uh, wasn't allowed to see him, and he ended up getting prosecuted and convicted in a trial that was almost a duplicate of Chun's trial from 2006. Same inability to get lawyers, uh, the same uh, inability to bring witnesses, uh, the same lack of a genuinely open trial. Uh, it was totally unfair. And the boy, his nephew, got three years and three months, and that's why he's invoking as far back as the Tang Dynasty, the seventh century. They recognize the legitimate right of self-defense, mm. but in China today, although the law recognizes it, mm. in practice, uh, it often uh, is ignored. So let, let, let's take as a given, based on experience of all three of you and based on what we read in the newspapers that there are many injustices in the Chinese legal system but I want to ask you all again what is it that American lawyers or law firms can do to address structural issues or non-structural issues uh, and a sub question is there a danger if the movement um, to support Chinese law seems to be too heavily influenced by foreign people? Well, uh, that's a key question, but we have quite a lot of experience on it. Uh, I lived in China from early 79 until September 81. The wonderful thing was the Chinese Communist government welcomed us. They wanted our cooperation. There's a built-in contradiction in their system. On the one hand, they have developed legal education since the end of the Cultural Revolution. There are now almost 700 law schools and law departments in China. They want to train their people. They want to enact better legislation. They created a legal profession first on the Soviet model, then for 20 years there were no lawyers in China. But Deng Xiaoping decided if you're going to have economic development, you better follow Lenin's advice. You need laws, otherwise investors won't have confidence. And you need lawyers at least to make a show of things. But Deng Xiaoping didn't want lawyers who would be independent. He wanted really Soviet-style lawyers who would be considered socialist workers workers of the government. And what we've seen in China from 1979 when they started to develop a serious legal system until 2007 was a gradual progressive development of lawyers. They were no longer going to be socialist legal workers of the government, but they were supposed to be an independent profession serving clients. And the high point was 2007. And by the time the lawyer's law was revised to reflect a lot of these improvements, a period of reaction entered into. And since that period, things have gone backwards with respect to fulfilling the legal system. But the production of law continues. We just have a, quite an interesting, worthwhile new criminal procedure law went into effect January 1st. But the whole atmosphere since 2007 is very repressive. And how in this contradictory environment 
where the party has created a kind of Frankenstein, you have now 215,000 lawyers, whereas when I was there, there were virtually none, 1979, etc. And these people, most of them keep their nose clean, they want to just go on and have a decent living like most lawyers everywhere. But many of them, a large number, have become public interest lawyers, and a smaller number but significant group have become what they call weitranlusher, rights lawyers. And some who never intended to be either by circumstance have just got dragged into becoming rights lawyers willy-nilly, and they too have been persecuted. And what we've been trying to do in the Committee to Support Chinese Lawyers that's been organized with the Leitner Center for Human Rights at Fordham as our base, and Liz Elizabeth Wickery is one of the active people and others from this Bar Association, we've been trying to support those who are out there, the most courageous people, some of whom are absolutely uh, hopelessly incommunicado in prison many of whom are under daily repression, even though they are nominally free. And we're trying to help them. And help, of course, long-run legal education. Law firms have often cooperated, giving lectures, bringing people here, etc. But how to help them, who those who are really being persecuted, isn't easy. And the law firms, the American and other foreign law firms that are based in China, won't touch the matter. Uh, we've tried to have meetings in Beijing, et cetera. Uh, they can't rock the boat. They're in a highly competitive uh, situation looking for law business. It's highly expensive, very expensive, I can tell. I used to run the, our Beijing office. Uh, and you start making noises against the government, and you may find your access to government officials is gone, and clients prefer to go elsewhere. So. It's not a simple matter what to do, but I think there are some things that can be done. What, what do the two of you think in answer to the question, A, about what can be done, and B, is there any risk of if too much of what's being done seems to be foreign instituted or instigated, does that undermine the natural, hopeful growth of the lawyer the law system in China. Uh, two questions. One, can we do what we have to do? Uh, I think that the second question first, interpreting for Mr. Chen. Uh, and when something, when injustice happens, you can't worry about uh, the adverse consequences of speaking out. Uh, Diorgana,第一个问题呢,就说,其实帮助中国律师的这个方法有很多,但是最重要的一点就是我们应该有这样一种想法,首先不要把它看成是两国之间的相帮,而是把所有的同事律师行业的人看成是我们的一个整体。我们同时正当的律师职业的时候受到这种不公不法违背国际惯例的这样的对待的时候我们要整体去发生 um, To go back to your first question, what can uh, foreign lawyers do? I think there are many ways to help Chinese lawyers, but the basic idea is we shouldn't look at this as two different countries. We should look at lawyers, wherever they are, as being part of the same profession. And when we see injustices, if we act as a profession, uh, then we can be effective。我记得有两个名字让我记得意义很深。一个叫记者吴江杰，一个叫医生吴江杰。我想律师也应该是没有江杰的。当律师的职业权受到侵害的时候，他所侵害的不仅仅是这一个律师，或者说这一个国
there should be an organization of lawyers without borders. And we should look at this from a professional point of view. When, when lawyers are not able to practice their profession, uh, then no matter where they are, other lawyers should speak out. Um, I'm going to try and add my, my answer yes, to your please. question. Yes, please. I was going to force you to do that if you weren't offering okay. to. All right. um, I would say that um, we have to be realistic, that there is a difference between lawyers and law firms who operate in China uh, and lawyers uh, and law firms who are, are not, don't have a presence in China. Um, uh, and it's not just lawyers, it's, it's other organizations as well. When you're um, uh, you know, lawyers who are working in China and law firms are um, guests, and guests can be asked to leave at any time. Uh, and as Jerry said, it's very difficult for one law firm to uh, stand out uh, when there's so much competition among other law firms. But the fact that it's difficult to do things is not really a reason to not do anything. And there are many, many things that uh, lawyers and law firms in China can do to help promote the rule of law. And many of them are doing some of these things, offering uh, scholarships to law students, offering training. Uh, but I would say that um, in this field, uh, the Chinese government uh, has not said we don't want the rule of law. They haven't said we don't want human rights. In fact, they've said the opposite. They've said that our goal is to establish a society under the rule of law. They've said that and they've written human rights into their constitution. So there is a great role for lawyers to use the law to protect people's rights. Um, I think that when you're outside of China, it's easier to be more vocal and to be more critical. Um, and that's just a fact of life. Um, and there's no reason why lawyers can't do that. Now, um, uh, I do think that um, uh, this goes back to your question about the Ford Foundation. To a certain extent, uh, what we'd all like to see is that China live up to its own laws and live up to its own rhetoric and to also help them get to that point. Um, so, for example, um, Professor Cohen and I have been working with partners in China on how to implement this new criminal procedure law. Uh, the new criminal procedure law has a lot of good things in it, some not so good things in it. But, for example, among the good things are many new provisions to try to prevent police torture during investigations. Uh, well, that's been the common way that the police have obtained confessions and done investigation. It's not that different from the way American police did it, criminal investigations in the 1920s and 30s. Well, the Chinese have put laws in place, including a law that requires videotaping of all police interrogations in serious cases, something that many people, probably in this organization, have advocated in the state of New York. Um, now, what we try to do is to try to bring the best available expertise, whether it's from here or from other places, to China to share that experience and to show how in other countries, including here, they've tried new practices and they work well. Uh, they work well to avoid getting false confessions and convicting innocent people and to still ensuring that the police can do proper investigations. And uh, our Chinese partners, including the police, including prosecutors, including courts, are in general very receptive. Maybe not uniformly. It's hard to change the way you've been doing things for a long time, but we, uh, we, we get a great reception and we keep getting invited back. So there are many things that uh, you can do that are constructive, um, whether you're in China or whether you're here. Of course, it's harder to help those lawyers who are singled out or single themselves out as human rights lawyers. But there are things that can be done. Of course, we try to ventilate the worst cases where these people are in prison. Some of them are kidnapped. They're treated to stormtrooper Hitlerian tactics, bags put over their head, beaten, taken away, the children threatened. These are the human rights lawyers. And every day, those who are still able to be out of confinement have problems. If I go to Beijing and I call a rights lawyer up, 
say, why don't you come over for dinner tomorrow? He'll say, I'll have to call you back. I have to go outside and consult my minder. And the minder says to him, you want to go to the office tomorrow? Don't see Cohen for dinner tonight. And that's the kind of life they live. Uh, huge numbers of people are engaged in monitoring these people. Millions of dollars, seven million US dollars equivalent in renminbi were spent in confining Chun and his family. When he fled, there was anger because he ended a lucrative local industry. 200 people were being paid, things they hadn't been paid before to keep him confined. They lost employment. They were getting one to 200 renminbi a day. Well, we can help these people in various ways. We sometimes are able to invite them here. They need moral support. They want to know they're sacrificing themselves for values that we share and respect. And it's that psychic support that may be most important. But they also have to eat. And if we can find ways to send them business legitimately, that will help them. Because one of the tools against them, used by the Judicial Bureau and the Lawyer Society, that's supposed to protect them but really oppresses them, uh, one of the things they do is they try to take away their livelihood. They often take away their right to practice law. Uh, sometimes they send them to prison for too vigorous uh, advocacy, and they really sometimes drive them out of housing. Uh, I have a distinguished former lawyer in Shanghai who's been disbarred, sent to prison for three years, Mr. Zheng Unchong, and they told his daughter, you might as well leave China. You're not going to go to the university you want to go to. And she's here in New York now, had to learn English, had to learn a way to make a living. So they have many sanctions against these lawyers, and we can use whatever we can to try to help them, recognizing it's too limited, but it's better than doing nothing. So if I, could, if I could just add. Ira, go ahead. Um, you know, as Professor Cohen said, um, in some ways 2007 seemed to be sort of the height of the profession and things have gone backwards. I think in China, those of us who have observed China over a long time have seen a struggle between those who would promote the rule of law and promote greater use of the law and those who have no faith in the law and are afraid that rights lawyers will undermine the monopoly of the Communist Party and will limit the discretion, sometimes arbitrary, actions of the government. Yes, the law is and going to right after this. One of the things that American lawyers or lawyers around the world can do is to support those who support the rule of law and support these values. Because as uh, Mr. Chan has said many, many times, he said tonight, the purpose of the law is to bring order to society. There are those in China who think, uh, I mean, all the things that Professor Cohen was talking about were we can't use the law to, to protect order. We have to use these uh, abusive tactics to quiet critics. Well, there are other people who have a different point of view. And we can support those people in many different ways. So I think we'll now turn to the audience. Um, just I want to remind everyone, first we want you to talk, but remember that we have three extremely thoughtful and knowledgeable people here. So ask a question or make an observation. But if it's an observation, don't have it too long. because. And if you can, draw the three people in. Anyway, yes, sir. And we have microphones at either end. I'm um, Bob Manley, one of those hybrid folks, uh, both a lawyer and a political scientist. And probably more as a political scientist than lawyer, I spent a year uh, in Beijing, uh, September 01 to July 02 at the Chinese Foreign Affairs University, teaching there. Uh, uh, what, and I will, can I translate? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. What the name is called Bob Manley. I am also a doctor, but I am also a scientist. But I am also a scientist. I was in China for a year. I was in China for a year. I was in China for a year. So this, to, this is a very important panel tonight, and it's so wonderful to have Mr. Chen here. Um, 
But it reminds me a little bit of the panel that the Asian Society had only a few months ago, partly sponsored by the New York Review of Books. And there was a lot of dancing around there. Prof from Harvard and others didn't really want to tackle the question of what kind of regime there is in China and the need to change that regime. Now, I know that is not the topic of this panel, but I'm asking Mr. Chen or any others on the panel if they would care to comment on uh, not just trying to lawyer to lawyer help lawyers, but also get rid of this regime, which is bound to be as abusive as, as it has been to Mr. Chen and his family. Uh 人权的这个侵犯人权的这些活动是没有办法停止不知道你们三位对这个问题要不要回答我想改变一个政府可能要从某一个切入点一步一步的去改变比如说我们要说怎么能帮助中国的律师那么首先我们从律师协会的角度应
former school teacher turned human rights lawyer named Jung Tian Yong. I said, please go down uh, to Shandong on the night train tonight. And I knew he didn't want to go, but he said, okay. Well, before he could go, he gets a call a couple of hours after our call from the lawyers uh, association regulator in the Judicial Bureau, the government agency, shouting at him, you can't go down there. We didn't authorize you to go. You mustn't go down there. And they refused to let him go. Now, how did they know? They were obviously listening to our telephone call. And they're very, very efficient. In March 2006, I sat in the lobby really in the coffee shop of one of the major hotels in Beijing where I was staying. There were a dozen human rights lawyers around the table. One of them was the famous human rights lawyer Gao Zhisheng. I said to these lawyers, what kind of strategy are you going to adopt? Are you going to fight the game with one arm tied behind you, trying to use whatever legal protections are available, or are you going to try to overthrow the government? Well, most of them said, we just have to be practical, and we'll fight with one arm tied behind us. Gouger Chung made a wonderful statement. No, we've got to overthrow the government. We've got to work, otherwise there'll never be real freedom. And just what you were uh, pointing to, he said. And I said to him, look, you're right, but that's not going to get anywhere. Uh, if you go on like that, you're not even going to be on the street in a few months. And Gao Zhisheng then was disappeared, and he's way out in the west of China, cut off from everybody, being imprisoned, and he was tortured horribly. So the practical people are trying to go step by step. As Iris said, there's a daily struggle in China. If you believe in justice, if you believe in the rule of law, you've got to take part in this and support the people. And as for your concern, the Chinese government, having imported Western values, legal education, Western-type legislation, the Constitution that sounds very good but isn't enforced, etc., they now think they've created a monster because these lawyers want to use all these tools. And they're taking the nationalist bit are saying these people are instruments of Western imperialism. We'll never have uh, separation of powers. We never believed in Montesquieu, etc. And this is what's going on, but it's a daily struggle. And I don't think we should abandon the faith because there are a lot of people in China, not just the rights lawyers who are up front, who are working one way or another to try to improve the system. And all we can hope for is gradual progress. And with the new leadership now coming into power in China, and Chinese New Year's this weekend, the time to think fresh, etc., we can only hope that we, with renewed effort, can do something. And there are many things we can do, even though they may seem discouragingly too few. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, my name's Roger Pugh. I'm a member of the association, uh, but I'm also the UN representative of Lawyers Without Borders. So I, my question is, uh, we would like to uh, work in some way with you. I have a feeling we're not as heroic as uh, uh, the panelists are, uh, particularly Mr. Chang. Uh, and I remember, I think, hearing in the Bar Association about uh, a gentleman that said the best thing to do uh, was to keep a low profile and then keep contact with the government. And then when you ask to sit, speak with an official, they, they'll let you talk to him or her. In any event, I'd appreciate uh, any suggestions you have with Lawyers Without Borders. Thank you. <laughs> Did you understand the question? I think I, I heard about 90% of, of what you said. Um, you said something that you're not as something as the panelists. So I didn't get that. Heroic. Okay. Okay. Well, one of the 
two of the panelists. <laughs> um, uh, 我的视角是这样的,我是联合国的这个有 五边界的律师的代表 你就可以提出一些建议 有不同的结果受到了不法的对待，我们去发声。我相信就能起到很好的作用。There um, there are many ways to cooperate. There's no set one way of uh, cooperating. Um, as far as making suggestions, it depends on who you make the suggestions to, or who you have the opportunity to make suggestions to. For example, uh, if you talk to Zhou Yong Kang, who was most recently, before this leadership change, in charge of the political legal system in China, who was considered to be quite a conservative person, uh, your suggestions might be of no use. But if you had the oppor opportunity to talk to Zhao Ziyang, the late Zhao Ziyang, who was the leader of the country before June 4th, um, he would listen and, and your suggestions would be effective. So I, I would say in sum, uh, the best thing you can do is just to stay in touch with uh, Chinese lawyers and treat them as uh, colleagues in your own profession. and. Uh, recognize that we we are all part of the same profession. So, I, Ira, speaking for yourself or Jerry, do you have any other comments on the question? Well, I, I agree with uh, what Mr. Chen said. Yes, there are many ways to uh, work. And I, I talked about people who are in China versus people who are outside of China. And there are many people who have different styles. I, don't, I agree. There is no one way. Um, uh, and I, I think it can be self-defeating to say there's only one way, and to criticize uh, folks who do, you know, there, there are people who are very loud in their criticism and very sharp in their criticism, and occasionally they turn their critical skills against people who are working in a different way. I think that's self-defeating. Um, uh, the last thing we want to do is create tensions and unhappiness among the different groups working for improvement. That's one of the unattractive features of many uh, emigres, refugees, dissidents, so-called. There are many lawyers in China who by doing, especially those who take part in administrative cases against the government and criminal justice, by doing their daily work are making a contribution and within limited scope trying to improve things every day without going to jail. People under uh, authoritarian governments, whether in South Korea or in mm. China, South Korea and Taiwan in the mm. old days, not today, you have to make a judgment how to operate and different people have different preferences, different family situations. Uh, Xiao Zhisheng, when I talked to him, reminded me of my old friend in South Korea, Kim Dae-jung, Jin Da-jung, because Kim really was an idealist inspired by Roman Catholicism and by Jeffersonian democracy. He really believed the tree of liberty has to be nourished by the blood of patriots from time to time, and he was prepared to sacrifice himself. And Gao Zhisheng is that kind of a person. I think after he'd been tortured for a long time, he weakened 
and he, when he came out for a brief time, he regretted it and started again to oppose the government and has now been put away for quite some time as a result. These are horrible choices people have to make. And I think our task is to try to help where we can. And of course, we do legal education, we do training, we try to spotlight individual case abuses. Many of us work for years to try to get Mr. Chun and his wife freed. Uh, but you also try to use the public sphere if you're comfortable in that. Some people say only use private diplomacy. Well, I think we have to use everything. And some of us are comfortable in going public and some of us aren't. I went back to academic life after 20 years in law practice because I wanted to be free to speak out in a way I didn't feel totally free, although I did speak out to some extent when I was in law practice. I didn't feel in law practice I could selfishly embarrass and harm my partners by taking a 100% all-out stand against abuses. And I felt much freer. The great thing in America, of course, is a law professor can quite promptly get tenure. And that it gives him a security to speak out. But in very few societies, people have that luxury. So we have a certain responsibility that comes with the luxury that we enjoy. Hello, uh, everyone. My name is uh, Martin Flaherty. Uh, my in-laws have given me the name Ma Ding. Uh, and I teach human rights at the Leitner Center at Fordham and also at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton. Um, and I want to do one thing, which was to uh, plug the organization Jerry helped found and mention, which is the Committee to Support Chinese Lawyers. If people are interested in following these issues, including uh, Mr. Chun's nephew's case, um, if you Google that site, you could uh, get information about that and get on the email list of that organization. Um, my question uh, goes to, again, what lawyers can do and what law firms can do, particularly ones that do business in China. Um, they have, you know, as was said, a real concern and a genuine concern about repercussions, you know, if they rock the boat. However, a fear is that that becomes an excuse for doing nothing, and a fear of doing nothing is that when lawyers, uh, U.S. lawyers or other lawyers, say nothing about some of these issues we've been talking about, including the brutalization of not just Weichun lawyers, but, you know, other lawyers, silence becomes almost a sign of approval, or at the very least, indifference. So trying to balance these concerns, what is the realistic space for lawyers and law firms with a footprint in China to do things? It seems to me one would be certainly educate yourself about what's going on. But also, are there really going to be repercussions if you informally bring up certain cases or bring up certain concerns in talking to Chinese colleagues? Um, because there are going to be colleagues who are concerned about the rule of law, and the same with officials as well. So you don't send the message that you know we here in the U.S. are completely indifferent to everything uh, that's going on. Um, I call uh, Martin Flaherty, Martin Professor. Uh, I'm the Fordham Law School Center. 我在这儿想做一点宣传怕政府中国政府对他们的采取一种报复的行为的话我的担心就是他们什么都不做而他们什么都不做什么声音都没有的话这个就等于是赞同政府的行为所以我的问题是有没有现实的空间在中国的外国律师能做点什么至少我觉
，也可以低调的提出这些问题，呃，但是我怕如果什么都不做的话，呃，真的是，呃，反而会起一个呃负面的作用。Well, I, I don't know if Mr. Chen wants to answer, but I'll just speak for myself for a second. Uh, one of the great things about having a, a bar association is that um, it provides some protection for individual lawyers and individual law firms. And uh, so a committee like this uh, can certainly speak out on behalf of the bar association um, and speak out publicly and speak out quietly. Um, you know, Professor Cohen, I would say, has um, and I learn from him every single day, has mastered the art of delivering honest, respectful criticism uh, in a way that is welcomed in China. Uh, many people would find it hard to believe, and he, I, I hope he, well, I know he minds me saying this, so I won't say I hope he doesn't mind, that, that's pointless, but um, <laughs> if you read his writings, his columns, uh, monthly columns in the South China Morning Post, he is as critical as anyone uh, of the things that he finds unjust in China. But his criticism is fair, and it's honest, and it comes from a place of, China, you can do better than this. And when we go to China, and he speaks to audiences, uh, he gets an amazing uh, reception. So uh, a lot of people uh, think you can't speak honestly and still uh, be heard in China, and I think uh, Professor Cohen is uh, a tremendous example that that's just not the case. That's a, that, Jerry, that's a pretty nice compliment, I'd say. Well, he exaggerates somewhat, but I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> of course, he is my boss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Art Block. I'm an association member. Uh, my question has to do with the dilemma of American law firms working in China. I wonder whether uh, there could be a useful analogy and some stepping stone uh, looking at the experience of American universities like NYU that recently have been opening campuses in China, in the Middle East, uh, Yale's um, contra somewhat sometimes controversial um, uh, partnership with the um, Singapore National University and so forth. The universities in this situation, the American universities, they have something to refer to in making their commitment to how they will operate in an environment that is not so conducive to academic freedom. They have the, um, the principles of academic freedom adopted by the AAUP and the American Association of Colleges and Universities more than 80 years ago. So when somebody criticizes them uh, and can says, you I'm sorry, can you, I need to translate, so I have a good memory, but <laughs> it has limits. So can, let me f translate, and then you can finish your question. Okay, sure. Okay? We hope. Um, this is really mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, the point of 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 the Jerry, the the just to make the question really short, it was can American law firms in China learn anything from how American universities operating overseas have dealt with the Issues of American values and local values. American universities from the beginning of the open policy in 1979 have been eager to help and American law schools have done as much as any to participate. Uh, we confront problems, of course, and 
Luckily, until recently at least, in Chinese academic life, you can say a lot more than you can outside of academe. Uh, recently, it's gotten tighter. And luckily, most university people in China, certainly in the law field, have been able to travel abroad, take part in conferences. We have many come to us as visiting scholars, as Columbia does. Uh, these things go on, but lately there has been a tightening up. Just last week, there was a conference on labor law here in New York. Eight people from China were supposed to come. Only two were brave enough to show up. The other six were told, most of them by the Shanghai government, which portrays itself as more liberal than the rest of China, that's erroneous, they were told not to come. And this is happening. We were expecting a leading woman's human rights lawyer uh, to come here, and she was told not to come because of tension between Japan and China. What a facetious reason for not coming to talk about women's rights in China in America. So we're having problems, but we have to keep working at it, and quite a lot is still being done. And we just keep, if you can't do it one way, if the judges aren't allowed to meet with you formally, so maybe you then try to use the university in China as the intermediary. And the judges want help. Most of them are highly professional people. And people in China, whether they're prosecutors or even police, want to feel their job has some worth, that they're contributing to society, that they're not evil people. And the problem is, is to be able to respond to them and to reach others who think the right thing to do is to crack down because the country needs stability. I hope that got to the essence of your question. I'm, I'm going back side to side yeah, to I, your I would next. just put in a, a plug for shorter questions. That's yeah. just cool. a, out of kindness to the interpreter. Um, <laughs> thank you. Just asking for shorter questions. I'll, I'll interpret my own question for you. That's even better. I'm is a called Chen 今天之前不知道这个信息,所以我想您可以展一展您这个方面的经验和挑战。那我先放你。My um, uh, name is Kevin Slayton. I'm, from, uh, uh, I'm in an organization called China Labor Watch. We uh, advocate for the rights of Chinese workers in China. Um, I'm sorry, Chinese workers in the uh, manufacturing industry, um, primarily. And um, my question is, Primarily regarding, uh, you, you don't need to repeat it because when they answer, I think they'll get the essence of your question for the English language speakers here. Sure, okay. Which means one of the English language uh -huh. speakers should be the first answerer. Uh, <laughs> 他在外边打工的时候受到工伤以后后来这个钱找这个老板也没有办法讨回 
Well, there are many, many migrant workers uh, in China. And if I could just make a little footnote explanation for those who aren't familiar, uh, but migrant workers means people who are from the countryside who come to the cities uh, or other places to find work. And they run into a, a couple of different kinds of legal problems. One is workplace injuries. People are interest, injured on the workplace and maybe their employers give them a little bit of money uh, for their medical expenses, but they don't cover, provide other compensation, uh, compensation for them. So that's one problem. The second problem is the failure to pay wages. Uh, many people work for an entire year um, and expect to get paid right before Chinese New Year, around this time of year, and then their boss disappears and they can't find them and they, they don't get paid. Um, uh, these kind of problems are relatively easy to address. Sometimes with a lawyer's letter, um, you can obtain some redress, um, and sometimes you can use other methods um, to, to get redress for, for these workers. Uh, <coughs> 这样的事情在应该怎么说呢？应该说律师的参与会使得这些人更有信心的去解决这些问题，否则这些当事人很有可能连这个他的你离开这个公司以后，连再进这个公司的都是非常困难。and let me say that when lawyers participate in these kinds of cases, they give workers much greater confidence that they can solve these problems. Because once it, someone is dismissed from a job, they can't even get back into the workplace. Many 所以有时候我们只能根据他要这些农民工遵守的一些这个所谓的规定来确定他们是不是老无关系。In uh, many cases, uh, these kinds of workers don't have employment contracts. And so uh, when a dispute arises, it's very hard for them to prove that they were actually an employee of uh, the organization. This is one of the most difficult problems in obtaining compensation. And I just make, speaking for myself, uh, two quick points here. Uh, the failure to pay wages was a huge social problem in China several years ago uh, because when you can imagine the anger that people would feel uh, having worked an entire year, they got room and board, but when it was time to get paid, they couldn't find their employers to pay them. And so it, it became a problem of social stability. And at that point, there were the government did many things to try to solve this problem, but one thing they did was they allowed lawyers to provide legal aid to migrant workers. And many public interest lawyers who started out representing migrant workers to get compensation uh, established public interest law organizations that are still in existence today and they're still doing this kind of work. So it's one of the good uh, positive stories about uh, rule of law in China. But the second problem, and it's a problem we work on uh, with our colleagues who are labor law experts at NYU, is this problem of how do you prove you have an employment relationship? There are many Chinese labor laws quite good at protecting the rights of employees if you can enforce it. And one of the things that employers in China have gotten very clever at, and you probably know more about this than I do, is uh, how to hire people through companies, through intermediaries, without establishing an employment relationship so that none of those rights uh, can actually be enjoyed by, by their workers. I should say that uh, the worst advice I've ever been given about China and its legal system, I was given by my first research assistant, who'd been a Shanghai policeman until the revolution, and he fled to Taiwan, and ultimately came to Berkeley to get a degree. And he said, you're wasting your time trying to analyze Chinese law in the terms they use. Chinese don't care about that sort of thing. Well, my whole experience in half a century is Chinese are experts in interpreting individual legal terms, and they're imaginative in how to manipulate terms and how to use flexible kinds of techniques to avoid legal obligations. So this labor law situation is a good example of how employers can manipulate 
the terms of the law, and that then puts a premium on ultimately who's the interpreter, who's going to make the final decision. And that's also affected by politics. Uh, I would say there are several distorting factors uh, in the Chinese legal system. One is political interference by the party system. And there's a big debate right now, can they get the party out of individual legal cases, court cases? Another is local protectionism. It's hard to get a fair hearing in one city if you're up against a local company and you don't have to be a foreigner, you just have to be from another province. And it's hard to get fairness there. Another is corruption, huge corruption now. And unfortunately, some lawyers get involved in corruption, uh, either passively or actively. Not the rights lawyers, obviously. And the fourth and most difficult thing to eradicate is what the Chinese call guanxi, relationships, networking, who you went to school with, who your cousin introduces you to, uh, all kinds of behind the scenes things. Uh, factors that are much more important than the legal standards. That, that's not totally foreign, for example, to New York City, I don't think. <laughs> so we have four more people, and try to be concise, uh -huh. each of you. Uh, I'm George Kong from Fordham Law School. Uh, on the issue of uh, cooperation and how we can help uh, in China, sometimes it's just by the uh, example of what we do. And uh, lawyers in the Gulf area, after B the BP oil spill, filed uh, actions on behalf of 100,000 people. And there was a comprehensive settlement. And a, a lawyer in Hebei uh, noticed that. And, uh, and the Chinese Supreme Court noticed that and issued new rules that seemed quite expansive about compensation for oil spills. And this lawyer in, in Hebei is a fisherman. Uh, owned, rather owns a fish, uh, a processing company. Rather, uh, he's an aquaculturist. He, he um, and 38 other law, lawyers uh, or law firms in China filed lawsuits. Only one of them was accepted by the court, and that has been in limbo. And uh, he organized. Uh, he sought out lawyers in Texas who have filed an action in the United States District Court for the Southern District of Texas on behalf of 176 uh, aquaculturists in the Bohai Bay, uh, about 150 miles east of, uh, of, of Beijing. And that action is, is now pending. And, and their claim is that they couldn't get a, a fair hearing in China, and therefore they've come on, uh, brought, brought suit here. And I just thought that was an innovative step by American lawyers to try to support Chinese lawyers. Thanks. So um, that's a good observation that's helpful, and there are opportunities outside China to do things that might affect China. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ting Wong. I work for the United States Court of Appeals. Um, I have one very brief question and one very brief observation, and just to help Ira out, I will, I'll translate my own question, which is for Mr. Chen, uh, which is that, um, during the period that after he was released from prison, released from prison, but confined um, to house arrest, uh, I'm, I was just, I'm just personally curious to know what he was thinking in those times. Chen uh, 先生你好,我叫汪听,在在联邦上诉法院工作。嗯。我有一个很短的问题和一个很很短的一个。请问。我就想知道啊,您刑满释放呃回到家里以后。在拘留在家里的这段时间里,您那时候都在想什么?这是我的很短的问题。很简单啊,想出来啊。Very <笑> simple, I was just thinking of getting out. <笑> That's good. Okay, my, now, now my very brief observation. Uh, for about two years until um, last October, I worked for a New York law firm in Beijing and Hong Kong. And I would, I would, I would, I would just wanted to let the audience know that uh, New York is not such a far, uh, such a faraway place for the average American lawyer in China. 
um, first of all, American lawyers are a small but fairly prominent group within China. They're among the most elite lawyers in the country. But the vast majority of them are native Chinese who had studied law in the United States. Almost all of them uh, are New York Bar certified, and virtually all of them have practiced for some time in New York. Um, so they carry with them certain values uh, back to China. And, uh, and in their daily work, um, New York form selection clauses um, are very common. New York Supreme Court, New York uh, Federal Court in the Southern District. Um, and, and many of these lawyers then become leaders in the Chinese firms once they leave the US firms to go to the Chinese firms. So there are a lot of, a lot of New York influence um, various channels. Um, and in working with them, uh, my, from my colleagues, I know that many of them are sympathetic to the rights lawyers, uh, or at least aware of the plight of the rights lawyers. And they're also very much aware of what Professor Cohen had talked about, about the constraints on the Chinese legal profession, which also affects them as well, especially since 2007. Um, what, what they don't have, at least in my experience, and something that Ira mentioned, is that they don't have like a bar association just for the American lawyers, or at least the New York certified American lawyers, to um, help protect them and to advance their common interests. Um, and um, it, it, of course, it makes it difficult for one particular lawyer for, or one firm to speak out. But if there was a, f a group uh, to help them, uh, that would be very, very, very helpful. And I think, I'm, I'm not sure if New York County, if you guys can set up a foreign chapter in Beijing or Shanghai. To save time, Ting, maybe at the reception you could translate for Mr. Chun. I, I want to say Ting is a great example of someone who has one foot in both uh, cultures and both countries and both legal systems. And as he mentioned, there are uh, now, I don't know how many US educated Chinese lawyers who are working in China. So when we talk about foreign law firms, maybe we're all thinking of uh, Americans. But in, in fact, as Ting says, many uh, lawyers have studied in both places. And I'll just tell one brief story. When I was at the Ford Foundation, we approached many Chinese law firms and American law firms to participate in a pro bono effort uh, that maybe was a little edgy. Uh, I didn't think so, but um, uh, we were not successful with American law firms or Chinese law firms. But at least in the Chinese law firms, the lawyers who were most sympathetic uh, and who I think did what they could to try to help us, were American trained lawyers uh, who were from China, who had gone back to China, who understood the value of pro bono work, and who understood the value of uh, working for, not just for profit, but also for social justice. And that desire is there, waiting for the right opportunity. Let's see, it's there, and you get the last chance to really wind it up with a zinger. So. Anyway, you're, you're first. Um, hi, uh, my name is Victor Xi. I'm going to ask this question in Chinese first. Uh, I'm Xi Zhonghan, I'm from the University of Jinping said that for the Chinese Communist Party, it should be able to accept the strong opinions. For the outside people, it should be able to speak the truth, to speak the truth. Do you think that this speaking is true? And do you think that the great government officials in China will accept this great government's mission? Uh, so my question is, Xi Jinping today said uh, the Communist Party must accept very sharp criticism, and people outside the party must dare to speak the truth, even if it's very unpleasant. My question to him was, uh, do you think that he's sincere, and do you think uh, cadres in the Communist Party will carry out his directions? <laughs> 今天晚上开始，我们回去不断的看新闻。如果从现在起没有人因为讲真话，因为批评共产党而被喝茶的话，我相信他。um, let's watch the news uh, very closely and uh, when we leave here tonight and we'll see if uh, anyone who dares to speak out and speak the truth uh, is invited to drink tea. Uh, this is a, a euphemism uh, for the police uh, harassing uh, uh, rights lawyers and other people who speak out. And if people who speak the truth uh, are not harassed by the government, then we'll know that he was sincere. 还有一点就是微博上的帖子还会不会被删呢？有很多批评共产党的这个帖子，如果从今天开始停止被删了，大家可以随便说了，我们可以相信他。
And one other thing, we should look at Weibo, which is the uh, Chinese Twitter, um, the equivalent of Chinese Twitter. And uh, if comments that are critical of the Communist Party are no longer deleted or censored, then we'll know that he was sincere. 说做不一是他们一贯的做法, 听其言, um, actions need to match words. Uh, sometimes the words have been uh, very nice, but the actions have not matched their words. But actions need to match words. My, my lovely wife, who does science work in China, frequently asks me to drink tea with her. I don't know what I should think about that. <laughs> Be very careful. Uh, <laughs> oh, then you, you save money on tea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good evening, my name is Natalie Pichy. I'm a Tony from Russia, uh, so I know approximately I can understand uh, the type of system uh, which uh, experienced Mr. Chen. And my question is to Mr. Chen. It's actually a really simple and basic question. Uh, what, what are his plans ever since he came to the U.S. and now when he's involved uh, to NYU and now when he'll get the formal legal education, because uh, as far as I understand and from what I read uh, from the uh, media, uh, that his practice was kindly determined uh, by the needs of the people who, were, uh, who lived in his locality. Yes, and, uh, uh, and so I would like to know if, he's con if he wants to continue the same practice, will it be again uh, the rights of uh, disabled people? Is he gonna to enlarge, increase his practice in human rights? And um, as well, uh, I can understand that obviously uh, he's not gonna come back to China ever soon, yeah? Uh, I don't think it's um, safe for him, yes? So. Uh, Living here in New York City, or basically in the U.S., um, what are his plans? How he's gonna help Chinese people? And if he wants to, if he'll enlarge his practice, will it involve uh, also help to Chinese people who live in the United States, whose uh, rights have been also yeah. abused and so on? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 提供法律服务是因为有人找你第一个就是继续捍卫人权 well, first of all, um, I will continue to um, work to protect human rights. And no matter where I am, no matter uh, what time it is, I will continue to do this work. In the past, people sought me out. Uh, perhaps now I will seek them out, although maybe I'll have to use uh, electronic means to seek other people out. So could would you be able to do your question when just talking in the other room, or I'm looking behind you? And it so get up there and. and okay, uh, I just uh, uh, ask Chen Guangchen. Uh, my question is very short. Chen Guangchen, I know you are from Shandong, but I am Zhang Jing, I am a Chinese national, a Women's Rights in China. 然后我这手上的有case是关于山东的 
，那是你们山东人，你还继续关注吗？还有另外一个 case， 这个是二零一二年十二月份，这个妇女。上面这个也是他和他的孩子一起死在手术台上，因为他们没有出生证。所以我想问你的是，你继续关注他们吗？还是说只关注其他的人权啊？或者是像今天一晚上，我都听到的是呃其他的呃其他的关于其他的故事或者其他的呃问题都没有谈到 one child policy 的这个问题。所以我想你怎么样关心以后你怎么样做？谢谢。好、啊，现在我们就谈到了天还没有亮，还是今天晚上。稍等一下啊。I think we should have a translation.、Uh, can you translate your question? You just summarize it.、Uh, I just summarize it very quickly. There are many、um, recent family planning cases in China of、uh, people who died during various operations. My question is, do you still pay attention to those issues? 啊，我想这样的案子我是肯定会关心的，没有什么怀疑。事实上。对于这个方面的情况，我也在了解。之所以没有太公开，我就是担心有些事情可能过早的公开会让我呃了解的不够深。事实上，这种暴力的寄生，这种被在手术台上强行做绝育或者做堕胎的这样的例子，举不胜举，而且到现在也没有停下来。而且我要再更正一点，也不仅仅是山东的问题，是一个全国性的问题。So I, I do still pay attention to these cases. I haven't talked about it very publicly, partly because I'm,、uh, I don't know all of the facts, and I wait, want to wait until I know all of the facts before I speak publicly. But I am aware of these cases,、um, and I'm aware of cases of people dying during uh, uh, compelled abortions.、Um, and I want to say it's not just in Shandong, but it's really all over the country. Okay.、Um, before. I say something at the very end, which will be total, very brief. Jerry had something he wanted to do. I just want to introduce Mr. Chun's spouse, without whom he wouldn't be here. He couldn't do anything. She herself, de facto, became a barefoot lawyer because she had to read to him the law books that we got for him, and she became part of this family barefoot lawyer group. And she's been indispensable in his life from the beginning. And she chose this life. She heard him on the radio. She sought him out. She wanted to be part of this strange, unprofitable, dangerous life. And she's a marvelous person. Please stand up, Mr. Henry. <laughs> So the first thing I want to do in closing is to compliment this audience.、Um, you've been a absolutely rapt audience, and that doesn't happen all the time. It happens probably less than half the time. You paid terrific attention, and I don't know if you can translate that word "rapt" into Chinese. Well, try. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, you, you've been great. And and secondly, to the honoree. I, I want to say it's a compliment to you to have this audience be so rapt. But you've shown yourself really worthy of this award, of course, for your record in what you've done and how you've been treated and how you've responded to that treatment. But just look at this man here tonight: articulate, analytical, kind, a sense of humor, and clearly passionate. About rights and reform, so I think we should give another round of applause for the honoree. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone, for your attention. Thank you. Ah, finally, I want to say to everyone that there is such a saying in the heavens that you can't lie to the law. Ah, no matter who the ruler is. 官越大，越看不起法律，越无视法律。那么，只要我们坚持做正确的事情，坚持对邪恶说不，我相信，终究邪不压正的事实会摆在我们面前。谢谢大家，非常感谢。Um, thank you. I just want to say, um, there's a, a principle, a universal principle, um, that when we see injustice, we need to do something about it. Um. 
And uh, if, when we see injustice, we just have to say no. Um, and I just want to leave you with that. So Ira, you, you've done a sensational job, too. I mean, that, that's not easy, that automatic <laughs> translation. And Jerry, you of course have been a hero in this field and in the field of law, both practice and in the academy. So you deserve a special round of applause. <laughs> and thanks to everybody. Alan, do we have a reception here or in the other room? Okay, great.